Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. All right, so we're up and running on the live stream now, and we can get this Zoom Bible study started. Um, sure appreciate the, the teaching that, that uh, Jacob has been bringing us, and I guess uh, what I'll do is I'll get us started with a word of prayer, and then Jacob can and pick it up from there. Lord, we come before you today, and we thank you so much for the opportunity to come and fellowship together and to study your word. We thank you for the Bible and what you've given us as a foundation for our lives. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to study it with diligence and so that we can use it to reach out to others who are um, maybe in trouble or backslidden, or especially people who are unbelieving. Lord, I pray that you would be with us today. I pray you'd give Jacob the words you want him to say and uh, just help everything to go smoothly today. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord God. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Let these things be glorifying to your name edifying to your people, upbuilding to your church in these last days. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you to Sandy. Thank you to Art. Thank you all for joining us. We're continuing studying the book of Colossians tonight. But before we do that, I had a uh, communication from a friend who was with us last week. I assume he may be with us tonight in the States. He asked, not for his own benefit, but he thought some others might have misunderstood something I was saying. He understood, but he's afraid some others may not have, that he asked me to re-clarify. So I'll just do that in case he's right. He may be right. Look with me, please, to Colossians chapter 2, please, verse uh, 18. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, instead without cause by his fleshly mind. Now, in some translations, the word visions is italicized. In other words, it's an interpolation by the translators to express the idea of the original Greek. I'll tell you what the original Greek actually says. Ma heroakin, ma heroakin. It's something that they didn't actually see, something that they did not actually see. They claimed to have seen something that was an appearance or an apparition, but they didn't actually see it. That is in no way to demean or to deny what the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, say about vision, haroma in Greek or chazon in Hebrew. It's no way to deny what the scriptures say about visions. A vision may be right or wrong, true or false, but there are visions. The book of Acts tells us, your old man shall see dreams, your young man shall see visions, and so forth. It's not to deny haroma or hazon, hazonim. It is to deny these claimed apparitions that people see. And we cited the examples of Joseph Smith with Moroni, the founder of Mormonism, and uh, Muhammad claiming Jibril or Gabriel, appeared to him, Jabril in Arabic, or Ellen G. White with the angel pointing out to her the, ten, the commandment thou shalt keep the Sabbath, Saturday, and so forth. These people claim to have seen things that they did not see. Now, that's not to say that they may not have seen something, but what they have seen is either a lie, it's contrived, it's made up, or it's something demonic. An example of this would be Doreen Virtue. She claims to have apparitions of Jesus. She's written five books, sponsored and promoted by people you wouldn't believe. Even after she was forced to admit it was wrong, after her fourth book, she wrote a fifth book, and it was promoted. And she was still being promoted by Chris Rosebro, who, after four books, continued to promote this apparition of, of, of Jesus, she claimed to have seen. Well, she described it to an artist and the artist painted it with no stigmata, with no nail marks in the metacarpal or the radius. It was an uncrucified Christ. Either she's lying, she made it up, or 
she saw something that was a counterfeit, a demonic counterfeit. But that was, of course, no problem with Chris Roseborough initially. And even after he did say it was a problem, he had a bigger problem. He has a statue of Christ in his own church who's not crucified with no nail marks. He has a false Christ in his own church. Well, these are the things we're warned about in Colossians. We're warned about people like uh, Ellen G. White, like Mohammed, like Chris Rosebro and, and Doreen Virtue today. We're warned about people like Joseph Smith. We're warned about these very kinds of people taking their stands on these kinds of visions they claim to have seen, but they did not see. They are ma heroikin. Ma heroikin. Now, I just mentioned this briefly. There are two other words we should note because one of them will come into uh, play in our study tonight. One is parousian, parousia. That is an actual apparition. That is an actual presence. But an apparition of Christ, it's a future event. It's when he returns. He says, I'm not going to come back physically except the way I left in, in the book of Acts chapter 1 at the Ascension. When you see people claiming to have had this kind of a actual physical presence of Christ, that is a lie. Now, the most common example of this, of course, is the Roman Catholic Eucharist. They claim a physical, literal return of Christ under the appearances of bread and wine, uh, which they say is transubstantiated. This is a false Christ. This is another false Christ. Uh, Chris Roseborough has a false Christ. Joseph Smith has a false Christ. Mohammed has a false Christ. All these people will wind up having a false Christ, another false Christ. We need to be very careful. But uh, the other word, after Perusian, is etymologically related to the word epiphany. Epiphany. Uh, to make something known, the word is fanarote, which means to render apparent or to make plain something that was hidden. To make plain something that was hidden. Now, what's quite interesting in the original language when we look at this, um, a major type of the Antichrist, of course, is Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes, almost like Epiphany, uh, and who's Antiochus IV from the Seleucid dynasty of Antioch. He's the one who set up the image of himself in the temple, giving himself the features of the Greek god Zeus. I'm sorry, giving the Greek god Zeus the features of himself and slaughtering the pig in the temple, a major type of the Antichrist, a picture of the Shikusa Meshomem, the abomination of desolation. Well, he's somebody who's to be revealed. He's got that same name. He's somebody who is going to be revealed. At the proper time, his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The world will find out about it after the fact. The apostate church will find out about it after the fact. Unbelieving Israel will find out about it after the fact. But the faithful believers, the church really won't exist per se at the time, but believers will. The faithful believers will have his identity revealed. So this is another important term in understanding uh, haroma, parousian, and fenerote, fenerote, okay? These words are all important. Now, let's commence where we left off, but first review a few things that are important because the first word of chapter 3, verse 1, is therefore. So when we see therefore, of course, it, it's predicated upon what precedes it. In verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. And then in verse 23, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion, self-abasement, and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Uh, you see this repeatedly and repeatedly. The most obvious example of the second of these things is obviously clerical celibacy, clerical, mandatory clerical celibacy. We're going to be free of any kind of marital romance or marital sexuality, things of this nature to be consecrated fully to God as some kind of a criteria for being in a priesthood, which is 
again, an apostate priesthood. It's, it's not the priesthood of all believers. The entire thing is corrupt. But what is the result of this? Well, the result of this is sexual immorality. Finally, after all these centuries, not just generations, centuries, we see the pedophilia exposed in the Roman church for what it is. These kind of things are useless. Another example is some of the more legalistic evangelical denominations like the Church of the Nazarene. They had a rule book, again, a massive rule book. And they thought they could achieve entire sanctification, some of them, as long as they kept all the rules in this book, which they ostensibly equated or not equated, but represented as being based on scripture. Because scripture says this, we shouldn't do that. And, you know, don't go to movies and don't do this and go, don't go to the circus and things like this. You know, Dr. Kent, John Kent, one of the leaders of that denomination, signed evangelicals and Catholics together. They were great at straining a gnat, but swallowing a camel. When you see people into this kind of thinking, it seems like they're into holiness. They're not into holiness. They're into nomianism and possibly legalism. It's not going to produce holiness. It's going to produce ultimately hypocrisy and scandal. So too, it captivates people. It seems to be right to people, but it doesn't. It doesn't. This goes back to the time of the Desert Fathers. Their motives may have been right, wanting to escape from the worldliness that permeated the church in the post-Nicene period, but they get into cloisterism, and that became more sick and carnal than anything. Still is. Well, let's go back again to let no one take you captive. Remember, false theologies that come into vogue are always related to the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Today, it would be things like consumerism and new age coming into the church. Well, it seems to be compatible with Christianity. It seems persuasive. It seems to be right. And the extremes people will go to try to make these arguments captivate people. There was an immoral man named Earl Park in Georgia, who would dress up like the Pope and things like this, but he was part of a movement that represented itself as evangelical. And when his sister Joan died, his argument was, well, Satan is a counterfeiter. The occult always counterfeits what's true. Well, that's a true statement. The occult does counterfeit what's true. Okay. But then he goes on to say, seances are wrong. Therefore, there must be a godly way, a correct way for him to communicate with his deceased sister. And he got into Christian seances. And people thought this still was true. <laughs> Some of the things that come out of the New Apostolic Reformation are absurd. But people buy into it. They become persuaded. The argumentation seems persuasive to some people. And we've seen this continually. We've seen people caught up in the moon is in Virgo thing of September 2017 and Revelation chapter 12 was being fulfilled on that date. People who were saved Christians got caught up in this stuff that was propagated by Robert Breaker, who's really a fringe element, way out there, false teacher. But people were persuaded by it. People always get persuaded by these things. And some of it gets to be very, very frightening. They tried to make it seem logical. They tried to make it seem compatible with scripture, but it isn't. Let's move ahead and look at today's subject. We're beginning in chapter three. Again, we have no chapter division in the original canon, as you know. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Okay, there we have it. A direct reference to the vision of Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7. A direct reference to what Stephen saw in Acts chapter 7. Jesus being at the right hand of the Father, 
that's where he is now. What is it saying? Well, because all these other things are true, because of the philosophies of the world, we should reorient our way of thinking. When you see people being caught up in the philosophies of the world while professing to be Christians or making the philosophies of the world compatible with Christianity, they are not really setting their heads on things above. They're not looking at the long-term end game. They're looking at this life. I've warned many times that most of the deceptions of Satan aimed at saved Christians today are to get them to trust in this life and in this world. What is on back of dominionism, kingdom now theology? Trusting in this life and this world. What is on back of the purpose-driven agenda? Again, this life, this world. Rick, Rick Warren teaches avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. We've got to think about this. Um, you see this with the word faith, money preachers. God wants you rich. You're a king's kid. Well, those things are true, but the dominion and the, and the wealth will not be realized until the millennial reign of Christ. No, they want it now. They stop setting their hearts on things above. Once believers, once we stop setting our hearts on things above, we will be captivated by things beneath. But the things from beneath that will captivate us will masquerade as Christianity. They will masquerade as being scripturally true, but they are not. They're simply the vain philosophies of the world, and they're inextricably, inextricably, writing on the back of the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Now, I've explained before, there are two books in Scripture that are really important in the Old Testament to understand the ethos, as it were, of or the theme of, of Colossians. These are Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. The book of Proverbs, we know it has prophetic material. About, about Jesus in chapter 30, and, you know, gathered the wind in his fist, what is his name, what is his son's name, things like this. We know that it is almost a key to biblical typology. It shows us what different words are figures of in different passages of Scripture elsewhere. There's that. We know it's wisdom literature. It's certainly that. But we can think of the book of Proverbs as God's book of psychology as scriptural psychology. Again, the human counterfeit of scriptural psychology, Freud, Jung, Carl Jung, whose idea of spirituality was the collective unconscious, it was basically a cult. Uh, Laszlo, these people saw spirituality as a function of the mind. Again, reducing human beings to apes with better DNA. It's, it, it, it is the psychology of Darwinism. What you really see with, with, with human psychology, with secular psychology, it's really veterinary psychology. It's veterinary psychology. Animals are body and soul only. Humans are body, soul, and spirit. We are tripartite, not bipartite. What you see in secular psychology is simply veterinary psychology. It's animal behavior applied to humans. That's all it is. While Proverbs understands there's the spiritual dimension of man. God breathed on Adam and he became a living soul. Remember what people are psychologically, what humans are psychologically, is a homogeneous compound, <laughs> a composite of what we are organically, physiologically, and what we are spiritually. It is a mixture, a hybrid, a perfect hybrid of what we are physiologically and what we are spiritually. While with animals, their behavior, their consciousness is purely a byproduct of organic physiology. With us, not. So only biblical psychology can understand the full dimension of man. 
We've been warning for some time. One of the vain philosophies of the world that's gotten into the church is the psychologization of it. James Dobson tried to psychologize the Christian women of America, and with some success, he did it. But it got to the point where he was saying things that were absolutely perverse. He actually had a broadcast that got him a kick off of some Christian radio channels where he was talking about, and I'm reluctant to say this, he was talking about Christian women using artificial devices for sexual stimulation. That's how I'll put it. Um, this was Dobson. Uh, <laughs> I'd kick him off the radio too. But that was women. You had promise keepers trying to psychologize the men of, of Christian America. You go back to Robert Schuller and these people who tried to psychologize the pastors. Uh, that's what it's about. It was a psychologization. That's what it was. It's the vain philosophies of the world, and they're trying to make it look Christian. I think Sister Sarah and Lynn are with us tonight. They've done a lot of research into this area, and so has uh, Deidre and her husband, Bob Bobo. They live in California. They wrote a book, 12 Steps to Destruction. They were Christian psychologists who, who came out of it, and they wrote an excellent book called 12 Steps to Destruction. I would highly recommend it. Uh, it's good to plug somebody else's book, not just my own. Other people do write good things worth reading. A Bobkin, that was a name, Bobkin. Uh, be that as it may, let's move on. Proverbs is God's psychology. Freud, Laszlo, Young, take your pick. That's man's psychology, but it infiltrates the church. So too, we have God's philosophy. As I pointed out multiple times, although there's a lot of other content including uh, things of an eschatological nature, for want of a better term, in the book of Ecclesiastes, which we call Kohelet in Hebrew, Kohelet. The book of Ecclesiastes is God's book of philosophy. You know, Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, so they may say some true things, but they say false things as well. There's a mixture. Hobbes or Beetham are the British ones, and then you've got the German rationalists and Immanuel Kant and Nietzsche and these people, you know, they, they all have their philosophies. These are the philosophies of the world. They may say some true things, but they say false things. There's always this mixture. Same as human psychology may say some true things, but it's always mixed with false things. With God, it's always pure. The book of Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, is God's book of philosophy. That's his philosophy. Where other philosophies disagree with Ecclesiastes, we part company with them because they're not true. They're deviating from what is true, yet they can make themselves look somehow compatible. Well, this is what Paul was warning about. You lived in the Greco-Roman world, and you had philosophers who had been in Greece, and their writings have been translated into Latin, as well as being available in Greek. And these things were influencing the way many people thought, not so much the poor and uneducated, but certainly the more learned people. And some of these things, unfortunately, made headway into the church. So let's resume with chapter three. Verse 2, set your affection on things which are above. The word for affection here is froniete. It means to be disposed towards it, to be disposed towards it. If your disposition is towards the temporal, there's a problem. The things that are temporal will disappear with the using. Everything we do is in relation to the eternal. Everything we do has to be viewed in relation to the eternal. Well, how do you know what someone's affection is? What do you have a real affection for? It's what you are disposed to, the things above or the things beneath. It continues, set your affection on things above, 
not on the things of the earth, as we translate it, but the word here is ges, ges, a, a, a terrestrial land. Don't set your affection on these things. Don't be disposed to them. They perish with the using. They are neutral. They could be used for good or evil. They are neither inherently good nor inherently evil. But once you set your affections on them, they will be used for evil. Anything, even something that is neutral, even something that is not of any antagonistic orientation towards the word of God or the things of God, even though it may not be inimical towards Christianity or antagonistic or contradictory to the word of God, it could be a neutral, harmless thing. If we become disposed to it, if that becomes our affection, you know, I've seen this. I've known some very good Christian classical musicians. And we've seen some classical composers who did tremendous things in praise to the Lord, like Bach and Handel, obviously. Well, that, that, that's true. But I've also met, and you've probably met, Christian musicians, classical musicians, that although they played Christian music or Christian hymns or maybe even Arashios, they played Christian things. Their disposition was towards the music more than towards the Lord. When you listen to something where the composer was disposed towards the Lord, like Handel's Messiah or Yehuda the Maccabee by Handel or some of the works of Bach or Mendelssohn, uh, who's a Jewish believer and a composer, you see the hand of Christ on these things. You see that it was not about the music, but about the Lord. The music was simply the vehicle. Now, this is important. Our affections, what are we disposed to? Is it about the music or is it about the Lord? Now, God can use the music. The music is neutral. It's neither good or bad. But if the affection is in the wrong place, it's not going to honor the Lord. Let's continue. He goes on. For ye are dead, and your life is hid in Christ. Literally, it is second of person aorist, indicative mood. I'm not going to bore you with all this, but it's active. It means basically you died. You, it's, it's a past event. You died. Um, for you died, and your life is hid with Christ, or with the one who is the anointed of God, literally say, is hid with Christ in God. Now, that word hid is important. Kek ruptai, kek ruptai, and we'll see in the next verse why it's important. It is hidden. It is hidden. Who of us does not have sin? Who of us has not dropped our crosses even as believers and failed the Lord? Who of us? The answer is none of us. The only one who never blew it was Jesus. The only one. Paul talking about not only his old nature, but after his conversion, as it were, to Christ, after his coming to faith, wicked man that I am, things I will still want to do these things. We have these affections, okay? Well, I've dropped my cross so many times, I would need a calculator. Unfortunately, I'm not alone. These things, and I don't necessarily mean things that I've actually done, but things that I desire to do. Uh, these are sins. Jesus died for these things. And I don't want them presented in an open forum. I want them hid. God can actually hide these things. And he can even go beyond that, although it's not in this text. He can make himself forget. God is so omnipotent he can actually give himself a case of amnesia regarding our sin. For the sake of his son, when he looks down, he sees the blood of Christ. 
he can forget our sin. If God himself forgets it, how hidden can it be? The things that we've done, God wants hidden. Keep it hidden, if possible. Now, we have another teaching from a long time ago on nakedness in the Bible, covering your brother's sin, when you have to expose it and when you have to hide it. But God prefers to hide these things. Believers are to appear before the bima, the bima seat of Christ to receive an award, to be judged on the basis of their reward. Our sin was judged on the cross. As you know, unsaved people appear before the thronos. They are judged unto condemnation. Their sin will not be hidden. Their sin will not be hidden. Now, God has conditions about this. <laughs> you want him to forget your sin, you have to be willing to forget the sin of others if they truly repent of it. Nonetheless, hidden. It's hidden. Some things are to be hidden permanently, and other things are hidden only to be made known. Thus, we come to the next verse. We see when Christ, our life shall appear. Hotano Christos Tanarote. Hezoe Hemontote. Then Kai Humias Sun Auto Tanaroso Sete and Doche. When Christ, our life, he is our life. To live is Christ, Paul says. Christ is our life shall appear, then ye shall appear with him in glory. There is that word I told you at the beginning tonight, thanero, thanero. Something that is hidden will be made to appear or be made manifest. Something will be made manifest. He shall appear, but when he appears, our glory appears with him. Now, how do we understand this idea of his glory and the relationship between his glory and you shall also appear with him? Remember when Moses came down the mountain, his face was glowing. He didn't know it, but other people did. It was the glory of the Lord being reflected from him. The glory of the Lord was being reflected from him. Now, the glory of the Lord can be reflected in a spiritual sense through our character and our behavior and things like that. That can reflect the glory of the Lord. But a time is going to come when Jesus comes back, when it's going to be visible, where what happened with Moses is going to happen to all the saints. The glory of the Lord himself will reflect from us. When he appears... His appearance is going to appear on, in, and through us. That's quite a thing. That's quite a thing to look forward to. Now, to make, I wouldn't call it an analogy, it's along the same line of thinking, but see if you can follow what I'm saying. I pointed out before that the Apostle John knew the Lord Jesus as a man. When he saw him in his deity, he fell as if slain in Revelation 1. When we look in the mirror, we see the man or the woman. Other people see a man or a woman. A time will come when the sons and daughters of God are revealed. They are going to see the glory of Christ, the Shekinah, from his spirit being reflected from us the way the Israelites saw Moses. They're going to freak out when they see what we are in Christ. But if that's going to be the case, how should that impress us and infect us to live now or affect us to live now? Probably a lot different than most of us do too much of the time. But this is what it's saying. Remember, the overriding message, theme of Philippians is Christ in relation to the church. 
its partner Ephesians, the church in relation to Christ. But let's look now at this a bit further. We're going on to verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, and ordinate affection, evil, and we translate it based from, the translators get this from Augustine, from the Septuagint, and from, from, from Jerome, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I'll try to translate it from the Greek as accurately as I'm able to. Necrosete, cause to be dead, to make something to be dead. Onte mele humon, your earthly members, like the members of your body, your earthly members. Te epe tes des pornion. When we're physically on the earth, on the land, what we do with our members when we're, we're in the tangible world, okay, and it begins with pornion, pornion. That's variously translated as prostitution, fornication, call it what you will. It's more of a general term for sexual immorality. For sexual immorality, it doesn't have to be specific. Sexual immorality. But then it goes on and it says, a catharsian, pathos, epihumion, kakin, kaiten, plionexian, hetes estin, idolatria. Well, that's quite a sentence. The first thing it says to deal with is sexual immorality. The drive to procreate, the drive to find sexual gratification is normally the second strongest human drive, at least a tangible biological one. Other people will have other things, people with addictions, uh, chemical addictions or, or, or compulsive gamblers even, even things that are non-chemical. There are other things that will become more important to them than the natural drives. Uh, that is actually possible through, through things like addiction and, and, and so forth and compulsive behavior expressed in certain ways. Other people become power mad and things like this. Those things actually become more important to them than biologically driven affections or, or things of that nature, including the sexual. But if somebody is not disposed towards the world's way of thinking, we all remain vulnerable to poor neon. We all remain vulnerable to poor neon. But then it says, e catharsian. We translate that uncleanness. I think a better way to translate it is from the Hebrew, lo tahor, lo tahor. David prayed in Psalm 51, lev tahor brali Elohim. We again translate that, create in me a clean heart. No, tahor, a pure heart. No Mixture, no mixture, no mixture. Oh, it could be a mixture. One example I give concerning porneon is a young couple who are in love. They get engaged. They are planning to marry. They really are in love. And they are committed to each other, and they're planning to marry. They may even be Christians. But in a moment of weakness, they are tempted to enter into fornication before they make marital vows to the Lord. Well, they really do love each other, but there's a mixture. <laughs> there's a mixture. The mixture is not good. When it's pure, there's no mixture. Lo tahor, a catharsis. When something is flagrantly wrong, that's easier to identify and easier to deal with. When something is a catharsis, it isn't. Now, this is more than sexual. Uh, for me, one of the things I've struggled with and still struggle with is the difference between righteous anger, a holy anger, and my own anger. 
the anger of man will never achieve the righteousness of God, yet there is a holy anger. Well, that line can appear to be very thin to us. I can be angry at something justifiably, justifiably, but the way I express it, even though my reasons for being angry may be justifiable, the way I handle it, that could be a mixture. And too often it has been. It's a catharsis. That's certainly true in the sexual realm, but it's true in all realms. The difference between greed and ambition would be another one, as we'll see in a moment. Let's continue looking at this verse. Verse 5 is an extremely important verse. Most of the chapter, again, and the chapter is not the original text, but most of the general, the broader passage hinges around verse 5. Okay. Make this stuff dead. Pathos epithumian, to be led by emotion, to be led by emotion. On our teaching on the grain offering, we go to some length to explain that emotion is a function of the soul. It is a good servant, but a bad master. In fact, it is a good servant, but it is a lethal master a lethal master. Be careful of people who think with their emotions. Now, this is more of the subject we deal with on the grain offering, but we've seen this. You're led by emotion. I know people who will not say something is wrong because of emotion. I know people who will lose their temper too quickly because of emotion, even though what they're saying may be right. Uh, we see this all the time. I've known people who will shelve doctrine, who will shelve truth for the sake of an artificial counterfeit of unity. The unity of the spirit depends on truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, not of error. Oh, wait a minute, you know, again, the ecumenical issue. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, or do you atone in purgatory for your own? That's the issue. That's the gospel. Oh, but we have to love. Where's the love? So in the name of love, you entertain a different gospel. But Galatians says if you entertain a different gospel, it's anathema. It's accursed. They think with their emotions. Emotion can be a wonderful, wonderful servant, but a terrible, deadly master. Again, I point you to the teaching on the grain offering, but let's understand this further. Emotion will drive passion. Now, physiologically, in the sexual realm, it is God who created testosterone, estrogen, <laughs> <laughs> and progesterone, those three magical potions that God created, uh, the sex hormones. He created them. Certain things are going to happen. You're going to have an increased production of spermatozoa. You're going to have ovulation. You're going to have a psychological predisposition to sexual interest simply because of what is happening physically. Now, because of the fall of man, we have a problem. We have a problem. Let's understand this. How do you deal with it? Well, it's not like saying, it's okay, I can be sexually entertained because I'm married, as if I bought the license, now I can do it. <laughs> it's easy to think that way. I bought the license, now I can do it. And it's not a sin. I'm not driving without a license, I have a license. I'm not functioning sexually outside of marriage, we have a wedding certificate. We made the vows. Da -da 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 -da. Well, how do we put this? You are using your spouse for sexual gratification. You are using your spouse for your own sexual gratification. How are Christians to handle this? It is a natural affection, 
But how do we handle that? To prevent your spouse from becoming a mere sex object. <laughs> well, you are to love your spouse's body the way you love your own. The church is the body of Christ. Husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Love your spouse's body the way you love your own. That's the basis. But when we read it, and when you look at what it says in Ephesians, and where Paul says, stop denying one another, and certainly aspects of the Song of Solomon, we see that your goal in marital romance, your goal should be the gratification of the person you love, not your own. The wife should be working for the or performing for the gratification of her husband. The husband should be in it for his wife. They should not be in it for their own gratification. You should be in it for the gratification. In other words, your gratification is in the hands of the person you're married to. That's one of the things that makes Christian marriage different than the world's. It doesn't just mean we have a license. Well, that's true. It doesn't just mean, well, if we do this, you know, we're not sinning, although that's, those things are true. Those things are, are, are true, but there's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. These passions that become emotionally driven have to be understood as servants, not masters. As servants, not masters. Sexual passion in marriage is a servant. It is not a master. Now, this is a subject in its own right, and there are other scriptures speaking of it. We're only looking at it in light of verse 5 of, of Colossians chapter 3, but let's continue. Okay. Then he goes on. Kakin, evil. Kaiten, Plenoxion, oh boy, avarice, avarice. I'm a demanding master. I gave you five talents. I gave you 10 talents. Where, what did you bring me? <laughs> Ambition is not greed, but covetousness, desiring that which belongs to another? Or when God is meeting our needs, not being content when the needs being met? Paul says if you have what you need, food, clothes, things like that, we should be content. I'm not nearly as affluent as some of the members of my family, and I'm far from as affluent as some of the unsaved people I, I, I was with in the world. Well, I'm richer than them eternally, but they're lost, but God was pretty good to me. Uh, I was able to put my kids through private school, private college. That was God's provision. I was able to build Moriel from nothing except faith in the Lord. That, that was God's goodness. I've got everything I need. I, you know, when I got sick and with the edema and my neck injury, I was still able to, to, get the medical treatment and other things I needed to to be able to serve the Lord. He's met the needs of myself and my family, and so I should be content. I should be content. If riches increase, don't set your heart on them. I should be content. We should be content. Again, one of the acid tests between greed and ambition is covetousness if we begin to desire that which belongs to another. The other is not being content, not being content when the Lord is meeting our needs. And he meets the needs in his way, on his terms, according to his standards, not necessarily our own. Again, a separate subject. We only touch on it relative to the text we're looking at tonight. But when you put these things together, porneon, ekatharsian pathos, epithumian kanken, kaiten, 
Pleonexian. We are told that these things are idolatry. Idolatry. People who are controlled by sexual passions are engaging in a form of idolatry. People who are controlled by greed are engaging in idolatry. They are seeking those things above the Lord. They are seeking those things above the Lord. Remember, the things themselves are not necessarily inherently evil. They could be used for good or evil, be it wealth, sexuality, or whatever, emotion, whatever. But the propensity will be for them to be used for evil unless Christ is at the center. Now it says, put these things to death, kill them. The person I was has to be crucified. It begins with porneon. Like most people of my generation, I was not a moral person. I was from the free love generation, and I was caught up in that sin. Uh, but past sexual experiences haunt Christians. Uh, how do you deal with it? He's got to be crucified. It's not the sin itself has to be crucified. The sinner does. The entire old nature, the old man, the old woman, the old creation has to be crucified. You're never going to get rid of the sin unless you get rid of the sinner. We will never get rid of the sin or the predisposition towards it or the old nature's capacity to resurface. We are never going to get rid of those things until we get rid of the sinner, until we crucify the old creation. Now, this relates to what Paul writes to the Colossians just before this, where he says, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, refer to things destined to perish. These matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom, self-made religion and self-abasement, severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. If you are trying to overcome a problem of greed or unrighteous anger or emotional self-gratification or something with lust, if you are trying to overcome those problems, you are doomed to fail. We are doomed to fail. You're never going to get rid of those things unless you get rid of the old creation. It is the old creation that must die. Once the old creation dies, that stuff dies automatically. What the philosophies of the world will do, what Satan will do, what misguided Christians will do is well, Christians will substitute legalism and nomianism for holiness, as we've said. But what the philosophies of the world do, what the misguided church does following the philosophies of the world, they put the emphasis on dealing with the sin. The only way to deal with the sin is to deal with the sinner. Kill him. The only way to deal with the sin is to deal with the sinner. Kill her. Let her be crucified with Christ. Any battle against sin is doomed to fail if you're focused on getting rid of the sin. <laughs> you can make all these rules and religious things. and Again, it seems persuasive and it seems right. Well, this is make me do this, and this is make me, I should. Yeah. That's not to say we shouldn't have, we should not avoid temptation. We certainly should. However, the victory over sin comes 
from the cross. It comes from the death of the sinner. Don't fall into the trap of thinking we can deal with our sin by addressing the sin. The issue is not the sin. The issue is the sinner. It's the old man, the old woman, the old creation. Now, again, I can tell you what these things mean, but if I sound like I'm preaching, believe me, I'm preaching to myself as much as I am to everyone else. These are the realities. Let us continue. They become idolatry. They become idols. Verse 6, For which thing's sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience? Um, we translate it, because of these things, the wrath of God shall come. And the word there is very strong. It is orge, orge, orge tau theo, the wrath of God. There are two aspects of this. There is the aspect of eternal judgment. That's one. But it is also an aspect concerning the last days and the return of Jesus. When the church is raptured, or I'm sorry, when the faithful believers are raptured, not the church, church won't exist per se, but when the faithful believers are raptured at the end of the tribulation, which is during the seven years, it is not all of it. We go from philipsis to the same word, orge. God will pour out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist. So we might say there are three ways that this wrath of God can come into play. First of all, we can see the wrath of God against a nefarious individual, against a bad person. Adolf Hitler blew his brains out, took cyanide tablets, blew his brains out. Okay, the wrath of God can come against a bad individual. Secondly, there's eternal judgment. That's the big one. But a time is coming when the wrath of God will not be reserved for the afterlife. It will come down into this world when the Antichrist comes into power, is revealed, makes war against the saints, Rapture and resurrection take place, the parousia, and then the orge of God will come. God's wrath can be manifested, expressed in three ways. With the individual in this life, with the individual in eternity, and then ultimately with individuals during the reign of Antichrist. Now, that's the individual aspect. Wrath can come corporately and collectively. The book of Lamentations deals with the corporate collective wrath of God when it comes against a city, a nation, a kingdom. They come under the wrath of God. What happened in 70 AD was a corporate example of the wrath of God. But it's always because of these things. It's because of sin, particularly the kind of sin that is delineated and, and stated. You know, the Sanhedrin were lovers of money. They were financially driven, like the word faith money preachers today. That kind of greed was one of the things that brought the wrath of God. When Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, and he warned the Pharisees that they were lovers of money, they hated him for that. He was a threat to their racket. They had turned the Levitical sacrificial system into a racket, much the way people like Copeland and so forth have done with the gospel, with the money emphasis. They turn it into a racket. When people oppose it, they go ballistic. You've touched their god, their idol, their mammon worshipers, You've, and they go ballistic. They go ballistic with it. Okay, so because of these things, the wrath of God will come. It's their idol. Verse 7, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. 
Again, what this is simply saying is we were no better and no different before we were saved. We were no better and no different before we were saved. But God expects us and empowers us to be different now. When you see these unsaved people doing these terrible things, remember that we used to be one of them. Let that stir the compassion to want to see them get saved as we've been before it's too late. Because if they don't, they'll come under the wrath of God. So we're told. Now, with that in view, because we used to be like them, verse 8, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Nune de apostasy. Um, be from placing kai uh, humies te panta, all of these things, all this stuff, as it were, or again, again, wrath. Human beings are capable of wrath. Unrighteous anger will lead to wrath. What Hitler did to the Jews was wrath. What the Roman emperors did to Christians was wrath. Wrath becomes a demonic manifestation, even a satanic manifestation. The wrath of Satan will be outpoured against the believers and then against the Jews in the last seven years of history. But then God's come, which is much, much, if not infinitely worse. We should get rid of this wrathful anger. Now, how do you characterize it? It's the next word, dumen, dumen. Or Dumenkakian, ferocious, like ferocious, a wrath that is something that's expressed in a fierce way and that it's malicious, that it becomes fierce and malicious, fierce and malicious. Like many people and other people in our ministry, I have and re I'm regularly slandered by false teachers and false prophets. I'm regularly slandered. They lie against me. They say things about my family. And I get angry to a degree. But I'm told in Romans, make way for the wrath of God. When we respond to wicked people, false brethren, false teachers, when we respond to the wicked in our own wrath, we block the wrath of God from coming. We block the wrath of God from coming. It's not to say that there's not a place for addressing evil, for refuting lies, but the vengeance belongs to the Lord. The vengeance belongs to the Lord. When we pour out our own wrath, no matter how justified. Now, this is, again, with women, it's often scorn. With women, it can be scorn. Um, women are good at keeping records of past things done to them. They're better at that than men are. Um, that is a weakness of the fallen nature of women. Men are more likely to express the fury. Women are more likely to keep a file. <laughs> But it's the same thing. It'll lead to a root of bitterness. It'll lead to a root of bitterness. And of course, the root of bitterness turns against us. But let's look at this. Cake and malice, or like evil malice, blasphemy, calumny. Now, blasphemy does not necessarily have to be against God. You can blaspheme God, but you can blaspheme other people. Okay? Uh, Calumny, slander, 
you say things about other people that are not true because you're angry at them. Instead of bringing an indictment for what they did do, you begin adding other charges. <laughs> you begin adding other charges because you don't like them. Is Kologian. Uh, could be obscenity or saying vile things, ectostomatosuman, out of your mouth. Vile things come out of our mouths. You can say someone is practicing witchcraft. You can say they're a witch. You can say the word of God says this is witchcraft. You can say that. But if you begin, <laughs> the witch of Endor, it says what she was. But if you begin to make the person the object of your own vengeance, you're taking the place of God. We're taking the place of God. His vengeance will be against the wicked. We shouldn't blaspheme. You can say the truth. You can bring an indictment. You can refute a lie. but we must not blaspheme. Now, blaspheme entails in the context and in the etymology of the words calumny, calumny, adding other things or saying things that are untrue in order to amplify or accent the things that are true. The bad things are bad enough. You know? <laughs> She think of a woman who her husband interrupts her sleep and she calls him a murderer. <laughs> You're deliberately trying to kill me. <laughs> and she's serious and she's angry about it. <laughs> well, that's a bit much. Let's look at it. Why not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds? Mi sudo este, es eleos, apectusemenoi ton peleon anthropon sun tais preisen oto. Not falsifying, not be falsifying into one another. Now, this is a present middle voice. Uh, It means you are in, in the habit, in the habit of misrepresenting or saying, not just misrepresenting, you're in the habit of saying something you know is not true. You are in the habit of saying something you know is not true. Uh, if I were to say, I never lose my temper. <laughs> And I try to persuade other people. And I misrepresent myself as a person who has that degree of emotional control when I get there. Well, I'm falsifying. I never finished a PhD. There are people who go around with phony doctorates. Phony doctorates. Because of a neck injury, I withdrew from Fuller Seminary. I never finished my doctorate. Never. And I'm... <laughs> Given what's become a fuller, I'm kind of glad. <laughs> Be that as it may, what are these people going around calling themselves doctor? Ah, uh, crazy, crazy. But there are people who do it. They've got phony doctorates. Um, this kind of thing happens all the time. They repeat a falsified statement. They repeat a falsified statement. Uh, I've seen people do this in all kinds of ways. They say things about other people that are calumnous, that are not true. Um, but they do it. Now, when unsaved people do it, it's one thing. When Christians do it, it's another. But we are told, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds... Literally, it means stripping off the clothing, stripping off the costume, stripping off the suit. Uh, the word prexine has the idea of it's something that you practice. 
the wrong thing that you practice has to be taken off the way you would take off a suit or a dress. Putting on the robes of righteousness, putting on the garments of salvation. As Isaiah put it, you take one suit off and put on another one. Well, let's look. Verse 10, and I put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. You take one thing off, okay, epigdusamenoi, but you put something on, endo semenoi, endo semenoi, putting on ton neon ton putting on the, the new or the young, the new or it could be the young, anakenomenon, being renewed, Anna, again, like Anabaptist, being renewed, um, ice epignosen, about the knowledge or about the recognition, hot according to or around surrounding, ekon or icon, tau kitsantos auton, of the one who is creating. When you take off the old, you put on something new, okay? And you do this in the knowledge that you're putting on the image of the creator. How do I explain what it means? John the Baptist deliberately dressed like Elijah, didn't he? He was from a Levitical family, but he didn't dress like a Levitical priest, even though his father had been a high priest. He went out and he dressed with the camel hair and things like this. He got dressed up like Elijah. He wanted to look like Elijah. He wanted to take on, or God gave him, the mantle of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah was on him. Hence, he didn't dress like a priest in Jerusalem, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and he dressed up like Elijah. Okay. He consciously did that. That's what he wanted to look like. Well, we are the same. We take off the old garment of the old creation, but when we put on the new one, we want to look Christ-like. We want to look like him. after the image of him that created him. Well, he's our creator, of course. Now, that was God's will from the beginning. Children look like or resemble their parents at birth. In second birth, we are to resemble the creator. In biological birth, you resemble the procreator. In second birth, you resemble the creator and, of course, the new creator. This happens. But then it goes on, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, free, but Christ all in all. Notice there is no woke culture in the church. It is not about race. It is not about ethnicity. It's not about any of that. It doesn't matter what you were born as or born into. It only matters if you were born again. Now, the Scythians were seen as the like really rough, uncouth people by their culture. They were from up north, like where Russia is. They were the Scythians. They were seen as the Barbar the, 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 the savages. They were seen as savages. Okay. But some of those savages got saved. I've seen people say that a fundamentalist Islam actually born again out of it. Doesn't matter how savage radical Islam was. They're new creations. These things happen. Orthodox Jews. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what somebody was 
before they got saved in terms of their ethnicity or their race. When people try to bring that stuff into the church, they are being sent in by the devil with an agenda. I don't care, and you shouldn't care, anything about someone's ethnic background. You can recognize, obviously, their ethnicity or their race or their culture. You can recognize it. But in terms of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, in terms of one faith, one baptism, it makes no difference. Zero difference. This woke stuff getting into the church is a lot of stupid garbage, total garbage. You had the Calvinists of the American South in the age of slavery. And they basically saw themselves as the elect and the blacks as not the elect. You had this in Ireland with the plantation period when the Calvinists occupied Ireland in the plantation period in Ireland. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. We're the righteous. We're the Protestants. You're the Catholics. There have been people who have perpetrated this kind of injustice in the name of Christ. Colossians says, don't do it. Whoever they are, whatever they are, if they're born of the Spirit, they're as good as you are. It doesn't matter what old suit they used to wear. It only matters what suit they are wearing now. Does it reflect Christ? Now it continues. And when it says this, it begins summarizing what Galatians calls the fruit of the Spirit, or at least it relates to it. When you put it on, endosethe, when you put it on, endosethe onhos eclectoi, the chosen, totheo, the chosen of God, put on, therefore, as the elect people of God, holy and beloved, bowls or containers of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, okay, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you also, will take the first verse, 12 first. Let's look at this. When you put on this new thing, do it as a chosen people. As a chosen people. The chosen of God. Holy ones. Hegioi. Okay. Notice this. Whenever the scripture speaks of the elect, Eclectoi, it's nominative plural. It is always plural. The only individual who was elect is Jesus Christ. We are the elect. I'm not elect. You're not elect. None of us are elect as individuals. We are the elect. The church is the elect. Israel was an elect nation. It is always, always plural. Jews who reject their Messiah are cut off from their own olive tree. They're no longer part of the elect people, even though they ethnically and culturally may be socially part of them. In God's economy, unless they repent and accept their Messiah, they are not going to be part of God's elect people in eternity. Many will come from the east and west and recline with Abraham and the fathers. Non-Jews will come. Jews who reject their Messiah will have made an irreversible mistake. Okay? But they're elect. It's corporate. We are corporate. Be careful of the Calvinistic poison that says God has elected us as individuals. No, 
He's elected the church. He's elected the body of Christ. He's elected Israel as a nation, but he does not elect one person for heaven and another for hell. That is just not his character. It is not his nature. It is not what the scriptures teach. Whenever the Bible speaks of election, electoi, it is always plural. You're elected for salvation. The people in the lifeboat are elected for salvation. You want to be part of the elect? Get in the lifeboat. Put on the garments of salvation, the life preserver, and get in the boat. Then you'll be elect. You're elect by being a part of the corporate. It's like a superannuation uh, retirement fund. You must be a member of it to benefit from it because it's corporate. If you're not part of the corporate, you're not elect. It's a corporate people. Now, I only mention this in passing, but whenever you see the word elect, you'll notice that you are elect. It's plural in, in Ephesians. Ephesians goes together, of course, with Colossians. It's a plural people. Verse 13, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Oh boy. Anacarmeno elion kai charism menoi, dealing graciously. Hietois eantis prostina eke momfin katos kai ho Christos. Dealing graciously among yourselves. If anyone it, with relation to another has blame according to Christ. In other words, if you have a quarrel, even a legitimate quarrel against another, be forbearing. And if they seek forgiveness, we are forbidden not to give it. We are forbidden not to give it. We want Christ to forgive us despite what we've done. He says, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. Not only will I forgive what you've done, I'll pay the price for what you've done. I'll do it. Providing you ask me for the grace to forgive each other. Now, if somebody goes into reprobation, if there's a backslider who does not repent and they go into this, or people who go into heresy and things like this, God will deal with them. We can't forgive them. We do not have the authority to forgive somebody in immorality unless they repent of it. <laughs> You see somebody who gets divorced and remarried with no scriptural grounds, we can't forgive that. They have to repent of it. You see somebody who's gone into heresy, fundamental heresy, like David Nathan, God the Father is not creator. You see somebody going into fundamental heresy, we can't forgive that. They have to repent of it. And they have to admit they were wrong. Once they do, however... We can forgive them. Now, this forgiveness issue is a whole subject in itself. I've known cases where preachers have fallen into immorality. They've gone into affairs, could have not even been an affair, could have just been a one-off or something like this. But once it is publicly exposed, can we forgive this person? Yes. Should we forgive this person? Yes. Does that forgiveness entail their right to go back into ministry? No. <laughs> when somebody repents and seeks forgiveness, they are willing to accept the ramifications of their actions. Remember Zacchaeus. I'll pay him back double if I rip them off. Remember Zacchaeus, the midget or river he was in, in Jericho? 
if there's a genuine repentance and a genuine desire for forgiveness, there is a genuine willingness to make restitution and to accept the ramifications of one's actions. If a leader in the church is known to have been involved in some kind of immorality or something like this, and which they're genuinely guilty, Paul says leaders in the church have to have a good reputation with those outside the church. If the world lies about you and accuses you of things that are false, that's one thing. God is our vindication. But if they can point the finger at you, let me make it plain. I do not forgive Jim Baker. I have no way to forgive Jim Baker because he's back in ministry and he's conniving once again. Oh, he repented. No, he didn't because if he repented, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing. I can't forgive Jimmy Swaggart. If he repented, not, not just the fact that he did it again, whatever. If he repented, he wouldn't be trying to get back in ministry. He would accept the ramifications of what he did. I'm no longer biblically qualified. Then I could forgive him. Then I must forgive him. But when to the detriment of the church, the repentance is not genuine. If we do not accept the ramifications of our actions, the repentance is not genuine. Now, God can be very gracious in forgiving people. He even forgave King Manasseh, which is almost unthinkable, but God did it. He can be very gracious. And he expects us to be gracious. But there must be a repentance. And when there's repentance, there's a bearing of the fruit of repentance. There's an acceptance of the ramifications of what one did. Now, this does not mean that the rest of us can go around beating him over the head about it and always reminding them of what they did. But it does mean that they accept the ramifications for themselves. Let's continue. Verse 14, and above all, all these things, as it were, put on charity, love, which is the bond of perfection or perfectness. Okay. Happy Passing Day, Totos, Tenagapen, Hetis Estin, Sundismos, Tes Teliotos. That word, Teliotos, is interesting. It is the word maturity, <clears throat> as we translate it. In other words, the world has a phony definition of the word maturity. The world has a phony definition of the world of the word maturity, a phony definition. Now, I don't mean, uh, you know, like a, a thing, a, a matured plant or something like that. I mean people. The world's definition is phony. The world's definition of maturity means to conform what I think or what society thinks you should be, to conform to society's standard. It's a phony, hateful word. But with God, it means something very different. It means divine perfection. It means being conformed to the image and likeness of Christ. Now that word there again, te teleo tetos. Teleo means end, like teleos, end. What God wants us to be like at the end. My personal favorite verse in the New Testament, as many of you know, is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It's my favorite single verse in the New Testament. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. That is maturity. When the work of God in our lives has been completed, that 
is maturity. It's not about conforming to anybody else's standard. It's about conforming to God's. And it is something that God has to work in us. Let's continue. That is true perfection. Verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, but be thankful. Now, we are told elsewhere, previously, let no one be your judge in verse 2. That word there is, do not be anyone arbitrating or trying to negotiate with you to accept something. Here, the word is, let her be arbitrating, or let it be arbitrating, brabioto, which is present active third person singular. Okay. And the peace of God, let her be arbitrating in the hearts. Okay. Now, the word here is erin, erin. Erin is a problem in itself because it means an absence of conflict. The Greek does not really have a way to translate shalom accurately. Uh, this is as close as it can come. To understand what Paul means by peace, we have to understand the underlying Hebraic thought. I know most of you know this, but for the sake of the recording, I'll go through it quickly, or for those who may not know it. Shalom comes from the Hebrew infinitive, le shalem, le shalem, to pay to fill, to fulfill, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. We have peace with God because Jesus came to Le Shalem to pay the price for our sin, to fulfill the law, the Torah, and to fill us with his spirit. We have Shalom because the Messiah came to Le Shalem. You can be in the biggest conflict of your life and have shalom, <laughs> the peace that passes all understanding. We can be in the biggest conflict of our lives and still have his peace, his shalom, as Paul had in this prison. Okay. Now, ultimately, God's shalom, the nations will beat their spears into pruning hooks. Ultimately, they're not going to learn war anymore. It shall not learn war again. Ultimately, his peace will include the absence of conflict. And the millennial reign of Christ and into eternity, it will include the absence of conflict. But that's not what it is. We can have shalom right now. We can't necessarily have irin now. In fact, we're told you'll have tribulation in the world. We can't necessarily have Irin now, but we can have Shalom now. Ultimately, we will have Irin as well. It'll include that. But right now, we can still have his peace. Not as the world gives. My peace I give you. Shlomi and Yeten Lachem. If he was speaking Aramaic, it would have sounded something like that. But let's look. Verse 16. Hologos to Christo Anoikitos, uh, anoikito, en human, prosios, and passe sophia, didas contes kai nuothentontes, hiectos salmos kai humios, kai odeis, numatikais, and kari adontes, ente cardia human to corio. Let the Logos, let the Logos, the word of Christ, ho Logos to Christo, uh, be abundantly, or plusios, like in, with wealth, in a, in a wealthy way, be wealthy in it, uh, in the word, dwelling in us. If the word of God is not in our heart, Jesus isn't. He is the Logos made flesh. If the word of God is not in our heart, Jesus isn't. Now, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
we are told. Therefore, when we speak, we should be speaking in psalms, in hymns, spiritual songs, with grace in our hearts to the Lord. What's in you is what's going to come out. <laughs> what's in your heart will come out. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If the word of God is in our heart, Jesus is in our heart. And if Jesus is in our heart, the word of God is in our heart, and we're going to speak that way. Unto the Lord. And whatever ye do, in word or deed, all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Okay. Kaipan and every which you may be doing and saying, or an act in the name of the Lord and Master. Everything we do, everything we do should be done to the glory of God. Everything. He then continues with family relations. And after family relations, labor relations. And then after labor relations, he talks about relationships within the church between individuals. These are important things. But we'll leave it right there and hopefully we will complete Colossians next week. Now what I want to do next week is complete the teaching but as we finishing the book next week it'll be a short teaching obviously shorter next week it'll just be chapter 4 and part of chapter 3 and chapter 4 is mainly salutations and greetings from people. What we will do is have the uh, Zoom open for Q&A, for questions and answers. You can ask any question from the book of Colossians that we've covered, but it must be from the introduction, from chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. It must be from the lessons that we've had. But we will do the Q&A, a complete Q&A, next week when we finish the book, okay? We'll have a Q&A. Um, I don't know how Sandy wants to handle it. If he wants people to send in questions ahead of time, that may be possible. But I think it's a good idea when you finish a, a letter, an epistle, to end it with a Q&A. Now, we can have a one or two questions tonight if they're relevant specifically to what we talked about tonight. But it must be very specific about tonight. But next week, when we finish, it'll be general, anything from Colossians. Well, Chris, I, I had a I, question. Go ahead. I tried not to bore you with the Greek and didn't get in much to the grammar, just a bit to bring the thing across because I just, it, it, it was just easier to explain it from the Greek than to try to uh, put it across as it's written because there's certain things uh, that are in the original meaning that don't communicate too well unless you break down the original, but I tried not to be too technical. Uh, on top of which, as any Greek believer will tell you, my pronunciation is terrible. Um, Christoph had a question for you. He said, how do you lead people if somebody tries to use Colossians 3.11 to justify unbiblical deeds, for instance, women pastors, etc.? First of all, that is not a passage that says there's neither male or female. I think he's referring to a different passage other than this one. Okay, there's either Jew or Greek, male or female. The answer is, do men have babies? <laughs> Did Hitler hate Eskimos? A Jew stays a Jew culturally, ethnically. A female stays a female and a male stays a male. There's no transgenderism in the church. Yeah. We retain the identities and the functions and the cultures based on 1 Corinthians 7. However, unto salvation, unto salvation, there is no distinction. 
people who are saying that are confusing salvation with function. They're confusing salvation with function. Women can no longer in God's economy be pastors of a mixed congregation than a male can biologically be a mother. It's transgenderism. <laughs> That's what you see today, this, this, this transgenderism. It is fundamentally wrong. It is only in the context, it's talking about salvation of the new creation. It is not denying that there are Scythians. It's not denying that there are Jews. It's not denying there are people who are circumcised. It's not denying there are barbarians, so people saved from those backgrounds. It's simply saying once somebody gets saved, the rest doesn't matter unto salvation. But they keep their identities. They keep their genders. Yeah. Okay? That's right. Um, one more, uh, another question from Tanya, Monique. Uh, she wants to know, since you touched on race, what you think about the black theology terminology introduced by the late James Cone. I, I would also say, what do you think of the critical race theory making its way into, uh, for instance, the Southern Baptist through uh, J.D. Greer? Well, J.D. Greer also said that Southern Baptists and their Christians should be the number one advocates for homosexual and lesbian and transgender and bisexual rights. So let's begin with who said it and what he is. We are one in Christ. It doesn't matter what color somebody is. Critical race theory is nonsense. It is complete and utter nonsense. If the society was as culturally and endemically racist as they want people to believe, okay, Barack Obama never would have been elected president because too many white people had to vote for him. <laughs> and that, that's pretty obvious, okay? How be it under Barack Obama, Afro-American families' incomes declined by $900 after two terms. Critical race theory. Oh, well, let's look at a country that has deposed white leadership and white rule and white aristocracy and set up black government. It's called Haiti. Find me a Haitian who's lived under black government since the 1700s that reacted against white colonialism in the 1700s. Find me a Haitian who does not want to live in a housing project in Chicago. Find me a country in post-colonial Africa where people aren't lining up to come into Great Britain and live in Birmingham or Manchester or London. Look at countries with black governments. The problem is not race. The problem is sin. It is not the fault of white people, not the fault of white people, that an Afro-American woman is five times more likely to abort her child than a Caucasian woman. It is not the fault of Caucasians that three out of four black children are born out of wedlock. It is about blaming other people for your own Sin. You cannot blame race for your own responsibilities when the <clears throat> facts are not there. Now, I'm not saying there are not white bigots. There definitely are. That guy who shot that church up in Carolina that time, about two years ago, three years ago, I hope that guy is capitally sentenced. I really do. I have no time for the Klan or for any. Black Lives Matter are no less bigoted. They are no less racist. It's all wrong. We are one in Christ. The world is fallen. End of story. It doesn't well, matter. Especially when you consider the fact that in, in all actuality, there is no such thing as race. We all come from <laughs> the same yeah. great, 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 great grandparents. And the thing I always say is I could go to Africa and get a blood transfusion. It's all exactly the same. Correct. So, you know, it's, it's a ridiculous thing to talk about. Um, let me unmute somebody here. Uh, Brent has a question. You can unmute yourself, Brent. Hi. 
Uh, Jacob, you touched on something that's really important to me personally, and that is you talked about focusing on killing the old man rather than trying to kill the sin, which will never, will never, never whip it. I'm totally the guy that understands that 100%. My 20 year Christian walk is just that really rung a bell. And I've never heard it said that way before. My question is focus on killing the old man. How do I go about focusing on that? Like, Reckon yourself dead. When they nailed him to the cross, you were nailed to the cross. I was nailed to the cross with him. He didn't just die our death. He said, get up here and die with me. Hmm. So just, he didn't just raise from the dead. He's going to raise up, up. His death is our death. His life is our life. His resurrection is our resurrection. Hmm. Okay. Yep. Rather than fighting it all the time and losing that battle. You're never going to do it. I know. I know that. You don't have to tell me that. I already know that. I'm just saying, just focus up here, eh? On, on fighting the old man, getting rid Lord, of Lord, help me to pick up my cross and follow you, Jesus. That's it. Daily. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. That will help me a lot. I've never heard it said that way before in my life. Good. Um, Mary, I'm asking you to unmute as well because you have a question. Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Hi, Brother Jacob. Thank Hello. you so much for feeding the sheep been praying for you from New York for your family and your ministry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is referenced to in verse five, you talked about the unity of truth and the ecumenical issues. And I know a bunch of us have been talking about this new TV series called the chosen. And I just wanted to get your take or your position on it because there's a dialogue that this director uh, has relationships with Mormons and Catholics. I believe the, person playing Jesus is a Catholic. They also have NAR musicians that are involved in the production of the series. They pray together. So I, I really just want to know how we can responsibly embrace or reject something like this. Uh, First of all, I don't watch television and I live in Britain, so I don't even know what that thing is. Okay. okay I'm on lockdown in Britain. I don't even know what that thing is. I can't comment on something I haven't seen. What I can tell you is what it says in Galatians. Mm -hmm. If an angel of God comes with another gospel, let them be accursed. The Roman church has a different gospel, a different gospel not compatible with ours. Auto atonement for your own sin and purgatory. Sacramental regeneration. They have a different gospel. Mm -hmm. Mormonism has a different gospel. Roman church has a different Christ as it warned in 2 Corinthians, the Eucharistic one, Mormonism has a different Christ, as does Catholicism. Okay, So you have a different Christ and a different gospel. Yeah. Uh, don't even begin with the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation. That's apostate evangelicism. Mm -hmm. Don't even begin with it. Yeah. They're as lost as the Mormons and the Roman Church theologically. Mm -hmm. Don't even begin with it. When you see a different Christ, a different gospel, and a different basis of spiritual authority other than Scripture, mm -hmm. you know it's the devil. Yes. I'm in agreement with it, I, with what you're saying. I know that Son of God with the uh, Roma Downey series, that was another one that people use it as an opportunity to witness, but some sometimes aren't aware of the dangers of where it leads to. So... Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about it, but I agree with you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, Cheney, I'm going to ask you to mute, unmute. You have a question? Yes, sir. Um, I just wanted to know if you can uh, give some comments on the Black Hebrew Israelites. They're absolutely crazy. They have no genetic or anthropological basis to what they're claiming to be Jews. Um, the closest thing there are are the Falasha Jews from Ethiopia, from the Lake Tanya area, who are black mm -hmm. African converts to Judaism. In the scripture, mm -hmm. in biblical anthropology, black Africans were called Kushim or Kushites from the land of Kush. That was a general term. It ranged, ranged from southern Egypt, upper Egypt as we call it, with the Nubian people, into Sudan and the Horn of Africa. That was known black Africa. They didn't know, obviously, about the Congo or Uganda or Kenya and things like that in those days, but they knew about the Horn of Africa and Southern Egypt. These were Cushing. They were the descendants of Cush. Um, 
Now, we do know that there were proselytes to Judaism from uh, the Kushites. And we know that uh, the first non-Jew, if you count the Samaritans as semi-Jews, if we count the Samaritans as semi-Jews, remember, the first total non-Jew, if we include the Samaritans as being semi-Jews, the first right. total non-Jew to have become a Christian was a black African, it was the Ethiopian eunuch. The first person that Jesus ever saved who was not mm -hmm. from ethnic Israel in, in, in the greater sense, right. meaning including the Samaritans, was a black African. These churches in Africa, I'm not saying I always agree with them theologically, but the Coptic Church of uh, Egypt, these are very, very ancient. They're, they're very old. Black Africans accepted Christianity uh, at a fairly early point. Now, there were pagans who persecuted Christians in those places, like there was everywhere else. That is for sure. But you'll find the following. Uh, the first medical missionary, Dr. David Livingston, he went to places mm -hmm. where they never saw a white person. They never saw a white person. There was a guy mm -hmm. called, uh, oh, what was his name? Willie, William, uh, he was the founder of Con Congo Inland Mission. I forgot his name. Um, he went to a place where they never saw a white person. Never mm -hmm. saw one into the Congo, never saw a white person. And forget about hundreds. They planted hundreds of churches, hundreds of churches. Black people have always responded to the gospel. Right. Larger numbers <laughs> than most other people. The problem that Africa has to this day is a lack of qualified leadership and some of the tribal influences of shamanism getting into the church and things like this. They've got, in other words, the church in Africa tends to be 10 miles wide, but one inch deep. Okay. But they have always responded to the gospel. Um, right. The idea of responding to Judaism the only thing that would even come close to that, the only thing that would even come close to that is that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church okay. does combine Judaism and Christianity. Now, of course, the Rastafarians picked up on this. The Rastafarians mm -hmm. said, <laughs> said that Haile Selassie was Jesus Christ and the <laughs> black exile in the... In, in, in the Caribbean, certainly in Jamaica, but also in, in the United States and, and then the West Indian community in Britain, that was the Babylonian captivity. You know, I, mean, I remember my Rasta friends smoking reefer with them, you know, <laughs> and if the cops would come in, they, here come the Babylon, you know, <laughs> that's what they would say. Here come. <laughs> okay, so they were not... These black Hebrew Israel, they were not the first one to try to come up with a black theology. Right, right. Okay. Um, Marcus Garvey did it way before they did uh, with, wow. with, with, with the Rastafarian. They're, they're not the first one. The other one who was totally crazy was Wallace B. Farad and Elijah B. Mohammed. They were really crazy. The, the Farrakhan's mentors. Okay. The, mm -hmm. the people who probably, almost everybody knows, knocked off. Uh, the Malcolm X, the guys with they had Malcolm X assassinated, um, the Nation of Islam. These black Israelites are not the first ones to try something like this. The wow. Nation of Islam did it. The Rastafarians did it. You know what I mean? It's a cult. Right. It's yeah. absolutely crazy, and it has no basis theologically, no basis anthropologically. There mm -hmm. are languages that are called Hamo-Semitic, Hamo-Semitic. Okay. But you only find it in Ethiopia. You only find mm -hmm. it in Ethiopia. You don't find it elsewhere, where you have a combination of African and Semitic language. Mm -hmm. You might have similar words to Hebrew and Arabic, but you only find it in Ethiopia. You, 
and they have a language called Gez, Gez, that's a Hamel-Semitic language. The, the, mm -hmm. the Falashas have their only books in this language called Gez, but it's limited regionally. This stuff these people are saying is crazy. They're a hate group, basically. They're a hate group. Right, right. They're a hate group. Wow. Yeah, I mean, and I, and, and I asked that because there, there are actually some churches that label themselves as Sabbath churches. And there, there was this one, this one particular fellowship that I did used to frequent, you know, years ago. <clears throat> and they started getting into the whole, you know, the black, you know, the black people, we're the chosen people of God and all this foolishness. You know, right here in Philadelphia is it's, it's a lot of just weird stuff. And I, you know, I thank the Lord that, you know, he made it clear to me that all of that stuff is just nonsense. I mean, I didn't care for it to begin with. But, you know, all I know when I saw that they were like veering in that direction, you know, I started to just wean myself from them because I, I just had this, you know, I guess you could say this sensing that they were starting to get into that because they were already pushing the whole dietary laws thing and everything. Yep. So it was just a matter of time. I remember in New York once I was trying to witness to them, which was a waste of time. but. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to read something in Hebrew. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> so I, I did, but I mean, uh -huh. they, they don't know anything. <laughs> right. Look, the, the, one thing you'll notice about hate groups: mm -hmm. they wind up becoming the same as what they profess to be against. Wow, yeah. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Ku Klux Klan, just ugly, ignorant bigots. That's all they ever were, is ugly, ignorant bigots from the lower classes of the American South. That's all those people have ever been, is ugly, ignorant bigots. They're almost gone now, but that's all they've ever been, is ugly, ignorant bigots. That's all they've ever been, okay? That's yeah. all they've ever been. You talk to this organization, the Black Hebrew Movement, Black Israel, like, what are you dealing with? Ignorant bigots. Yeah. They become yeah. the very thing that they're against. Mm -hmm. Now, in Jesus, Cheney, you're my brother. You happen Amen. to be black. I wouldn't black. care if you were purple. I <laughs> wouldn't care if you were green. <laughs> right, right. I care that you have a new suit. The garments Amen. of salvation, the robe of righteousness. I don't care Amen. what kind of suit you used to wear. It doesn't matter to God. And if it doesn't matter to God, it sure doesn't matter to me. Amen. I'm now, you want to brother. talk about culture? And, okay, I respect all cultures. Right. But that's all, that's all it is, is cultural. Right, right. All right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, appreciate that commentary. Very helpful, Jacob. Um, as he mentioned, you might want to come back next week because we're going to finish this up in Colossians and we're going to open the mics and he's going to answer a bunch more questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut off the live stream and uh, open up the mics for you guys just want to have fellowship, etc. cetera. Um, but I sure appreciate you guys coming out today. Um, check uh, check on uh, uh, Moriel TV on Friday because I'm going to be guest hosting with Jacob and we're going to be dealing with issues having to do with Israel and some other uh, interesting topics. Marco um, is away with David Lister this week. So Sandy will be filling in for Marco just for this week. But then right. Saturday, of course, we will have of the word for the weekend on Saturday. We'll have the word for the weekend on next Saturday. And that will be yep. announced uh, tomorrow, what it will be. The Friday uh, uh, teaching uh, is not on Zoom, but you can uh, view it on uh, Morial TV or RTM later. For more information about Morial, check out our website, www.moriel.org.